Praise the Lord. Would you turn in your Bibles tonight to Acts chapter 1. We've been in a series since the beginning of the year, Back to the Basics. We've talked about back to the basic disciplines of prayer, Bible reading, and fasting. I want to insert here, I want to thank you as a church because I really feel like we had the revival we had because you prepared yourself. You dedicated yourself to prayer and reading God's Word and fasting. And I believe God saw that you had prepared hearts and He moved. And that was back to the basic discipline. Then we began this month about back to the basic doctrines. And we've preached about the doctrine of justification. We talked about the doctrine of sanctification. And tonight we're going to talk about the doctrine of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I hope that that word talk didn't bother you. I meant preach. If you got bothered by the word talk, we're going to preach on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I believe it's a tremendous need in the time that we live in. Somewhere along the line, Pentecostals have got the idea that the Holy Spirit moves just to make us feel good. He doesn't move just to make us feel good. It may feel good when He moves, but He's got a deeper purpose for that than just making us feel good. We need the Holy Spirit. We need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We won't be able to cover everything in one sermon tonight, one message, but I hope we'll share something that will be a challenge to us. You know, I, I, I told myself I wasn't going to do this, and I won't run through them. But if I ran through the statistics tonight of Pentecostal movement, both denominational and independent, it would be shocking the number of people in Pentecostal churches today who do not know and have never experienced the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We're talking about in Pentecostal churches. It's alarming, Sister Christman, the number of folks that no longer have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so in, in that context, in the context of the last day life that we need to live, the last day world that we live in, we need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I can't tell you when the last time I've approached a subject with so much intrepidation. I mean, it, it, I mean, it's a serious thing to be the one that's speaking for the Holy Spirit. Because, see, see, the Holy Spirit's not just an emotion or the dynamics of the service. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the being of God. Hallelujah. He is God. He's holy. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I don't want him to ever grieve him or resist him or quench him. I just want him to have the preeminence in our lives and in the service. Now, I know we've, we stand a lot in Pentecostal churches. That's why we Pentecostal preachers like to preach long enough. You get rested up. So if you'd stand one more time for the reading of God's Word. Acts chapter 1, verse 4. And Jesus, being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. I hate to interject, but i got to say right here, the first thing we need to get about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's the promise of the Father. I said it's the promise of the Father. That means it'll happen if we let it. That means He's true and He will do this. It's the promise of the Father, which saith He, ye have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water. But ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Verse 8. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and in the uttermost part of the earth. Now I want to make one note before we pray. And that is sometimes in scripture it's translated Holy Ghost. Sometimes Holy Spirit. But in the original language the word is always the same. Pneumatos. It never changes. That's just a variation in the translation. Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. So we're talking about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now it may be more nostalgic to say Holy Ghost, that's unimportant to me. Which term that 
that we use or you use, what's important is that we have this promise of the Father and we have the experience of, of this baptism in the Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost, if you please. If you're hungry for that, a renewed experience or a fresh experience or an initial experience, would you lift your hands with me and pray that God would speak to us as a people. God, we come before you, Lord, in reverence. We want to maintain that sense of eternity in the service. Be here by your eternal spirit. Use me, O oh God, as a, as a vessel to speak this eternal truth, this truth of the experience that we so necessarily need, O oh God. Lord, that you would move and challenge us to all that you have for us. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. You can be seated. You know, the first thing I notice about the baptism of the Holy Spirit is that both John the Baptist, amen, and Jesus speak of the baptism of the Holy Spirit as something that's great and wonderful and amazing and desirable. Amen. When John begins to announce that Jesus will baptize with the Holy Spirit, when Jesus begins to talk to his disciples about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the tone and what they're saying is this is something the church needs and it's amazing and a wonderful thing that God does in the life of the believer when he baptizes them in the Holy Spirit. When John begins to announce the coming of the Messiah, the coming of Jesus, John gives as his credentials, his authenticating credentials, he gives as the thing that will show the world that this is truly the Messiah that Jesus is truly the coming anointed one. He gives us his credentials. He says the way you're going to know it's him is that because when he comes he is going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost. That's how you're going to know that it's the Son of God. That's how you're going to know it's the Savior of the world. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith of him, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. That's a announcement enough. That's reason to shout enough. He said, here comes the one, the lamb, that'll take away the sin of the world. But he didn't stop there. He said, this is who he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore, I am come baptizing with water. And John bear record saying, I saw the spirit hope and the heavens open and the spirit like a dove descending upon him and I knew him not but he that sent me to baptize with water the same said unto me upon whom thou shalt see the spirit descending the same as he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost I want to tell you tonight that Jesus wants to be your lamb that takes away your sin but he also wants to be the one that baptizes you with the Holy Ghost. Can you say amen? That was John's promise. Amen. I, Brother Clendenin has gone now, but I love to hear him tell about his baptism in, in the Holy Spirit in his personal experience. He talked about as an older man, an alcoholic, going to the altar and getting saved, getting his sins washed away. He got up so excited that his sins were gone. And he said that as soon as he got up from the altar, an elder met him and said to him what do you want now the baptism of the Holy Ghost he said I just got saved and there was that elder saying what do you want now the baptism of the Holy Ghost he said I looked at that man and said what's the baptism of the Holy Ghost and the elder said it's what's next it's what's next he said I looked back at that elder and said is it better than salvation that elder said oh no it's not better than salvation but it'll make salvation better 
Hallelujah. Oh, I'm telling you, it is what is next. He's the lamb that taketh away your sin, but he is the one who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, that power from on high, that enablement, that equipment, that joy, that power. Amen. Jesus is the one that does it. That gift is not in the hand of a man or a preacher to transfer it to you, his anointing to you. That's a bunch of false doctrine. Amen. It doesn't come from the hand of a preacher and a man. It comes from the baptizer, Jesus Christ. And so as you begin to see the urgency of what John is saying and what Jesus is saying before he left his disciples, you get the idea that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is something that Jesus does for his people and in his people and to his people and through his people. Hallelujah. And I want to ask the question tonight. Should we not desire what Jesus wants to do in us? Should, you, should we not desire what Jesus wants to do through us? If we do, it's called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You see, Jesus knew that his disciples then, and we now, we need far more than our own resources and ability is able to provide us. If we're going to make it in this perverse generation, if we're going to save ourselves from this untoward generation, we need something far more than our own wisdom, our own resources, our own ability. We need something far more than that which is just human and human ability and human talent. We need divine ability. <laughs> How many can recognize that tonight and say, I need divine ability. Oh, I'm telling you what he wants to do tonight. He wants every one of us to leave here with a divine unction from on high. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. And because he knew that we needed that, first of all, he poured it out because we needed it. If we had not need of it, needed it, he would have never sent it. He would have never poured it out. But not only did he pour it out because we needed it, he commanded his disciples to go go and tarry until they have received it. He said, I've got a task for you to do. I want you to live this life and be a witness and share the gospel. But if you're going to do that, you're going to need the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Hey, Amen. We've got a life to live as a Christian. We've got a gospel to present. But before we do, it's of all utmost necessity that we have the Holy Spirit baptism to enable us. Oh, hallelujah. Uh, we've, we've got enough talent uh, we've got enough ability of man maybe too much uh, in the church world what we need is a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit I'll tell you he can do in a moment uh, what man can never do in a lifetime he'll do it in your life tonight if you'll let him oh hallelujah you see it was ever it was ever the doctrine and experience of the church and if it ever was the doctrine and experience of the church it should still be the doctrine and the experience of the church you say folks say even that baptism of the Holy Spirit was just for the New Testament church I would just look at you and say what kind of church do you think Christ wants his church today to be he wants us to be a New Testament church. I'm telling you, Sister Brock, he's coming after the same kind of church that he left. Our commission has never changed. Our task to preach the gospel and be a witness has never changed. The devil has never changed. Amen. The way people are saved has never changed. The power that will convert a life has never changed. The way to victory has never changed. Therefore, it has never changed what we need to see those things happen. We need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. We want 
want as a people. I believe I speak for all of us. We want what the Bible says we can have knowing what it's what we need to have. I said we want what the Bible says we can have knowing that it's what we need to have and we must have and we got to have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I need help from him even in explaining these things. I'm going to try to deal for just a few minutes with some of the questions and things that come up and if the Lord will help me in a very simple way. One of the main questions, in fact I got it tonight in the foyer. I've had it this week in email. One of the main questions I get about the baptism of the Holy Spirit is this. Does it happen at salvation or after salvation? Whole denominations will teach that when you get saved, you get the Holy Spirit. You know what? They're wrong. You know what? They're right. You know what? We're right. You know what? We're wrong. How many knows from Wednesday night? The question's all important. The question shouldn't be, do you get the Holy Spirit at salvation? The question should be, do you get the baptism of the Holy Spirit at salvation? That's a whole other question. I want to tell you tonight why I say that. Because you can't even get saved without the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. And when He has come, He will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. No man comes to God but that the Spirit draw him. But the question they want to present is the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, part of the salvation experience, or is it an experience subsequent to salvation? Now let's agree with them, and I'll bring it all together. Let's say, as so many denominations say, in their confusion, they don't ask the question right, and they assume that someone gets the baptism of the Holy Spirit when they get saved. You know what that means, first of all? It means that these apostles in the 120 were never saved until Acts 2-4 in the upper room. If you get the baptism of the Spirit, when you get saved, then they could not have been saved. I'm not telling you I believe that. I'm telling you, if that is true, then they could not have been saved to Acts 2 and 4. If they weren't saved, Jesus shouldn't have been telling them to tarry for power. Jesus should have been telling them to repent. Because you're only saved by repenting and believing by faith in the work of Christ. I'm telling you, these disciples were already saved. Amen. But let's see how that happens. Let's see how that happens. Amen. You see, uh, if if you have that there, Brother Mike, in John 20 and verse 23... There when Jesus, the resurrected Lord, he visited his disciples there. He said, now this is days. This is days. This is weeks before Acts 2, 4. This is weeks before they were baptized in the Holy Ghost. It says, and when Jesus had said this, he breathed on the disciples and saith unto them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. He meant this is not just a promise of what's coming. This is not just just a reference to the coming baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is something altogether different. Well, what is this? Well, let's go way back to Genesis for just a minute. When God created man, he created him out of the clay of the ground. He sculpted everything of the anatomy of man. It was all there, a perfect sculpture. The only problem is it's still dead. It's still mud. It's still clay. But when God got that man, and sculpted the body sculpted the Bible said God breathed upon man and man became a living soul it was the breath of God that brought life physical emotional mental and spiritual life into man now I get excited when I talk about this we have a difference in our translation when we go from wind to ghost to spirit to breath but in the Bible in both Old and New Testament, it's all the same word in the Old and the same word in the New. Whether it's breath, spirit, or 
coast, amen, or wind. It's all the same word. And so when G, or when God breathed on the clay and it became a living soul, it's literally saying God put his spirit in man and man became alive. Now we have these disciples. They are physically alive. They've served God after the Old Testament sense. They have followed Jesus, but they've not yet been born again. And Jesus said, if you enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. And so they're still spiritually dead. But here, the resurrected Lord, he showed them his scars. He showed them where the sword or the spear went in. And then he breathed on them. And he said, receive this holy breath. Even I breathed on man once. He came alive, but sin killed that. And so I brought the breath back. I brought the breath of God back. And I'm breathing on you. Come alive. And these disciples were born again. You see, the trap we get in with this question, do you get the Holy Spirit at or after salvation, is we limit the Holy Spirit to doing just one thing. But I want you to know tonight, the baptism of the Holy Spirit isn't the only thing the Holy Spirit does in our lives. And what happened to man in general happened to Jesus in particular. How many knows how Jesus became born? The Bible said the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary and Jesus was conceived in her womb. Jesus was literally in every way, even physically, he was born of the Holy Spirit. How much more of the Holy Spirit can you have than to be literally conceived by the Holy Spirit. Wouldn't you say Jesus had the Holy Spirit? And yet though the Holy, he was born of the Holy Spirit, what happened when he became a man and embraced the ministry God gave him and walked into the waters of Jordan and said, for the fulfillment of righteousness, John, you need to baptize me. John was protesting, but Jesus said, I'm not being baptized because I've ever sinned. I haven't. Would you hear me tonight? I'm, not, I, I, I'm being baptized not because I sin, but I'm being baptized in water to set an example to all who follow me. I've been born by the Spirit. How much more spirit is that? Oh, but there's more than just being born of the Spirit. There is a baptism of the Spirit. And when Jesus came up out of the waters, the heavens opened and the Spirit of the Lord descended upon him. And he was baptized with the Spirit. And the Bible said he left that place filled with the Holy Spirit. And as his example is, we are both born again by the Spirit. But that's not the only thing the Spirit wants to do in our lives. He wants to baptize us with power. Let's look at it this way. I already re refer to it. If you're a sinner, He convicts you by His Spirit. He draws you by your spirit. If you surrender and confess your sins and repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, he breathes into your soul. And the biblical term is he regenerates. That means bring back life. He brings back to life that man that was dead in trespasses and sin, and you become born of the Spirit. But I'm telling you, that's not all the Holy Spirit does. Now that you're saved, you know what he does? He enables your prayer life. I'm telling you, we don't even know how to pray as we are. But the Holy Spirit, He can come and He'll enable your prayer life. He'll inspire your worship. You come to church, you don't even feel like worshiping God. But you begin to let God move and the Spirit will inspire you to worship. He'll open up the Word of God. He brings unity to the body. On and on and on and on we can go. The things that the Spirit does. But I'm telling you, there's one more thing the Spirit does. If we'll let Him, He will baptize you. I said you'll be baptized in the Holy Spirit and it'll empower you to be the witness of Christ on this earth. I'll give one more illustration and we'll move on in a moment. Where's my wife at? My kids are almost all gone. My grandkids are too far away to get much of a supply of illustrations. So for now it's going to be my wife. <laughs> right. 
Four years, I won't tell you all the details, she'd be embarrassed how she chased me, but four years before we got together. We were friends, right? That was it, friends. Just, just good friends. I'd picked on her, picked on her, picked on her. I was an upperclassman, picked on her. We just friends. I'll never, I'll never forget we were sitting in class. I had to make up a class. So I was in a, in a lower classman, a class, and she wrote me a note. Said, me and my brother, she had a younger brother for you. We're getting a new car. I wrote back, great. I said, uh, I said, is it, I mean, how many cylinders is it? She wrote back and said, I think one. I said, I said, I hope you enjoy your lawnmower. (laughs) So you can tell we were good friends. We were good friends. Then we started dating. And she caught me and we... We got married. So all of a sudden, she didn't just know me. We did just know each other. She did just know me as a friend. Now she knows me as her husband. But you know what? After we'd been married a semester, she was going to go ahead and graduate. She had to take some classes. And I was a teacher. So now she's sitting in my class. She had known me as friend. And she had known me as husband. But now she's having a new experience. She now knows me as her teacher. And then it came her turn to pay me back. I'd be trying to seriously teaching Bible. And she'd look at me and wink. (laughs) You try to stay serious. Do you get the Holy Spirit when you get saved? Yes, you do. That's what makes you born again. But you don't get the baptism of the Holy Ghost. She had a relationship with me as a friend, but I wasn't her teacher yet. Amen. It takes the Holy Spirit to get saved. But that's not what we mean when we talk about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. That's something other than conviction and new birth and, and all of that. That's something different. And Jesus is talking about that experience that we believers need. We need the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Amen. There's a group of those that have split off from the Pentecostal group. What they'll tell you is salvation and the baptism of the Holy Ghost are all one thing that you receive when you're baptized in water in Jesus' name and speak in tongues. They've just done something. They've taken away both from salvation and the baptism of the Holy Ghost. They've taken away from salvation because they've made some Something other than the blood of Jesus, the means of salvation. It's not water baptism, baptism of the Holy Ghost, and speaking in tongues that causes someone to be saved. It's putting your faith in the work of Christ, and as you confess your sins, His blood will wash you free from all sin. We are saved by the power of the blood, plus or minus nothing. But after that experience, hallelujah, we're saved by the blood, but we're empowered by the baptism of the Holy Ghost I'll hurry on another question is this thing about the spirit is it put on us or is it put in us or it's something that is done by the Spirit on us. I'm going to look at you look at a few scriptures and we'll bring this to a close in just a few minutes. But it says, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. To baptize means to put underneath, to immerse. So I want you to notice, first of all, we are put into the Spirit. Come help me, Brother Nathan. We'll make this like a baptism tank. Amen. You shall be baptized. Baptized in the Holy Ghost, just like in the baptism of water, you're lie, lie down. You're put under the water, all the way under. I mean, all the way under. Amen. That's water baptism, but that's stay right here. That's spirit baptism. Amen. We're put into the spirit. Amen. Baptism means immersed. But look at uh, chapter one and verse eight of Acts. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. Now it, Nathan's not being put into it. It's coming upon him. It's coming upon him. Then in Acts chapter two, uh, two and verse four. 
it said, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. It, he was being put into the Holy Spirit, baptism. Then it was coming upon them. Now it's been put into them. Amen, like filling a wineskin full of wine. That's, that's the picture there. So what is it? Are you put in it? Does it come upon you or is it put into you? I'm telling you, there's a reason they refer to the baptism in all those ways. It's because it's all of those. I'm telling you, when Jesus ascended to the Father, he poured out, he set forth the Holy Ghost, and it came upon them until it filled the basin. Hallelujah. And when the basin got filled, amen, Jesus baptized him under, into it. Now, I want you to imagine just for a minute, Nathan's not a young man. He's a bottle. Amen. And he's a bottle with the lid off. What happens when you take a bottle with the lid off and put it underneath the water? You know what happens? What the bottle is put into begins to fill the bottle. I'm telling you, he baptizes us with the Holy Ghost, but it said they were filled. Why? Because when he immersed them in the Holy Ghost, he filled them up on the inside. Hallelujah. It's all of those. Statements. The Holy Spirit is too big of a thing for any one expression to capture everything that it is. There is a mistake that many of our friends from other denominations make, and it's this mistake that leads them to say that the baptism of the Holy Ghost happens at salvation. I want you to see it in Scripture here. In 1 Corinthians 12, 13, this is a Scripture do we have that? 1 Corinthians 12, 13. This is a scripture that refers to salvation. Is there any way you can draw it up anyway? 1 Corinthians 12, 13. It refers to salvation, and it's got all three words in there, and it confuses them. It says, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. By one spirit we are all baptized into one body. Now, this is talking about salvation. Here's a mistake they make. Stand up, would you, Nathan? You're going to be the believer all night. I mean, I hope you are when you leave here too. But Noah, would you help me? Andy, help me. One to stand on either side of him. Here's where they make the mistake. Now, it says here in this verse, by one spirit, right here, Noah is the Holy Spirit. Don't forget, Noah is the Holy Spirit for this illustration. Nathan is the believer, and Andy is Christ. In this verse, the one body means the body of Christ. Here's how they make the mistake. This verse says the Spirit, go ahead, Spirit, takes a believer and immerses, baptizes him into the body of Christ. That's salvation. Okay? Now, that's why they say you get the baptism of the Holy Spirit when you get saved. I've, I've, I've had many times put this to me. But they're making a mistake. What did I say when I read the promise of John? It didn't say the Spirit would... Go ahead, help me, Spirit. It doesn't say the Spirit would baptize the believer into Jesus. It says Jesus would baptize the believer in the Spirit. This is salvation when the Spirit takes a believer and puts him in Jesus. That's salvation. But now there's another experience. Jesus now takes a believer and puts him into the Holy Spirit. That's a completely different experience. It's not what is being talked about by this verse where others of other denominations take this verse and say there's spirit, there's baptism, therefore there's the baptism of the spirit that's talking about salvation, therefore the baptism of the Holy Spirit is salvation. That's not talking about that. Jesus in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, one more time, Jesus is the baptizer and he puts the believer into the spirit and he holds him there hallelujah, until he gets filled with the spirit. It's all a picture. But what it's trying to say is this is something we can't do in ourselves. This is a gracious thing that our Lord does. It's a thing that only He can do. Only He can take the believer and put him in the power of the Spirit until his life is filled with the Spirit. Oh, just think about it. Wouldn't you like Christ to take you and just put you in the Spirit until you're filled with Him? Thank you, young men. You've been great help tonight. Oh, hallelujah. Another question. Was it just for them or is it for 
for now as well. I'm not going to preach long on this. I'm just going to give you this scripture. Some people said, well, yeah, there was a time when God baptized folks with the Holy Spirit, but that was for Bible times. Those days are gone. It's not for now. So was it for then or for now as well? Let me just give you the scripture, Acts 2.38. This was on the day of Pentecost. The first outpouring, Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sin, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto, and unto, and unto all that are, even as many as the Lord our God shall come, as long as the Lord is calling people. They are candidates for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. How many here has been called by the Lord? <laughs> Did he call you? You are a candidate for the baptism. I mean, there's too many folks out there. I'm not down in denominations. I'm just telling you what they're teaching. They'll tell you without batting an eye that all of that's passed away. All of that's forever gone. That all happened in Bible times. It doesn't happen anymore. I'll just refer you to what Brother Maggard was saying. The book of Acts was never completed. It never has a conclusion statement. It never has a conclusion paragraph. It never has a conclusion chapter. Why? Because the book of Acts has never ended. It's still being written. Why? Because he still baptizes in the Holy Ghost. Listen, if the promise to be saved is for us today, so is the promise of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Because Peter put them together. Believe and you shall be saved and being saved you can be baptized in the Holy Ghost. One more set of scriptures. Then or now. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 16. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine. We're in excess. But be filled with the Spirit. Amen. Just two more questions. What about tongues? When you get the baptism of the Holy Spirit... Will you speak in tongues or not? Now, I want to tell you, if I had time, I, I'm not going to take the time. I already have some worried. But I want to tell you, if I had the time, I would show you how one of the biggest errors of the church world today is, is they want to say, okay, come on. You can be baptized with the Holy Ghost today, but you don't need to speak in tongues to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. I'll tell you how they come to that in just a moment. But I believe emphatically the Scripture teaches the moment you are filled with the Holy Spirit, as a sign of that, you will speak with other tongues. Folks say that's just something people got from the Pentecostal church. I want to remind you, nothing was said about tongues to the apostles. I mean, there's, there's a vague prophecy in Isaiah that they didn't understand until afterwards. But Jesus and John the Baptist, no one said they would speak in tongues. It wasn't something they were expecting. It wasn't something they worked themselves up to. It was the result of their being filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you, we're not seeking tongues. Tongues won't do you any good. We're not seeking tongues. We're seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But the initial sign that the Spirit has filled a believer, hallelujah, is they begin to speak with tongues. Oh, I've got to stay off of why tongues. I could give you a long list. But let me just give you one that keeps trying to put, push its way forward. James said, if you're able to control, control that tongue, then you've got control of yourself. He said the hardest thing to control is is that tongue. He meant it's the hardest thing any of us have to control. I'm telling you, if you've given enough of God of yourself that he can control your tongue, he's finally got complete control. Hallelujah. That's why one of the reasons I believe they spoke in tongues, they had so completely given themselves to the control of the Holy Spirit that he gave them a tongue to say, this is a person I have control over. Wouldn't you like the Holy Spirit to have control of you? Now, here's what they do. And, I, you know, I, again, I could spend hours on this. I'm not going to. I'm going to give it to you in a little package, so forgive me for hurrying. But we got to do it. Here's what they say. In the book of Acts, there's only five instances where they spake in tongues, when, or only five instances when they were baptiz, baptized with the Holy Ghost, and only in three of those did they speak with tongues. I want to visit that quickly. Well, immediately we got to question their math because they're saying only out of 
Three out of five times did they speak with tongues. But I had to question their math because the first occasion where they were baptized with the Holy Ghost, there was 120. I want to ask you a question tonight. When the 120 were baptized with the Holy Spirit, how many of them spoke in other tongues? 120. Everyone that was filled spake with other tongues. The doctrine today is, well, you might speak in tongues when you receive the baptism, but probably not. It'll probably be some other sign, some other way that you'll know that you've been baptized with the Holy Ghost. But on the day of Pentecost, there was no variance. I said there was no variance. Every one of the 120 that was baptized in the Holy Ghost, they spake with other tongues. Oh, you may think I'm covering too much, but if you only knew what I was staying away from. <laughs> when I'm thinking right there, everyone begin to speak with tongues. Amen. They didn't preach the gospel with that tongue. Amen. It wasn't anything for showmanship. The Bible said when they were speaking in other tongues, those that understood their languages recognized that they were speaking of the wonderful works of God. Hallelujah. Oh, it was God-centered from the very... I'm telling you, that's the thing about the Holy Ghost. It'll come in your life to uplift Jesus in your life and uplift Jesus in the world around you. 120. Everyone spake. The next occasion we have a deacon, Philip, went down to Samaria to preach the gospel. I'm telling you, he started preaching Jesus. Brother Rose, it said he preached Jesus. And it said when he preached Jesus, demons came out and people were healed and people got saved. How do I know they were saved? Well, number one, the Bible says, but number two, Philip baptized in water. Don't you think Philip had enough sense not to baptize in water somebody that wasn't saved? Well, the leaders, the apostles in Jerusalem got word that folks were getting saved. Those half-breed Samaritans of interracial marriage were getting saved in Samaria. They said, how can this be? And so they sent two apostles, Peter and John, to check it out. And when Peter and John went and visited the revival at Samaria and began to see what was happening, they never once questioned those people were saved. They never said, you need to get saved. They never preached Jesus. They looked at those, Peter and John, John said, these folks, they are saved. They've been baptized in water. But oh, Samaritans, that's not enough. Thank God you got saved. Thank God you've been baptized in water. But there's something more. And it said Peter and John laid hands on them and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. The other denomination said yes, but it never said that they spake with tongues. And they're right. The scripture doesn't say that. But you know what it does say? Send up, Nathan. Now you're Simon the sorcerer. Amen. It said Simon, that sorcerer, he's used to tricking people. He's used to deceiving people. But when Peter and John laid hands on those believers and they received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, he knew that wasn't an illusion. Simon knew that wasn't deception or trickery. And the Bible said when he saw that by the laying on of hands they received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, he offered them money for the same power and gift. What did he see? What did he see? From the beginning, when this baptism of the Holy Ghost experience was talked about, it was talked about what was seen and what was heard. In other words, he saw a connection. He saw that when they laid hands and they were filled, he saw something to let him know they had really received what Peter and John had prayed for them to receive. There's only one conclusion in the pattern of Scripture. What he saw was the connection between the laying on of hands and the infilling of the Holy Ghost and the response from that person in speaking in tongues. Next instance, instance, oh, I wish we had time for the story when Peter had to get over his prejudice and go preach to Gentiles in Cornelius' house. Oh, oh, I love it. Once again, you know what he preached? How many knows what he preached once again? Jesus. How many believes we got too far afield on a lot of superfluous doctrines when we need Jesus? Hallelujah, Sister Cookie, I love it. It said, as he preached Jesus, somewhere in his preaching, they believe. But it said, as he preached Jesus, the Spirit of the Lord fell on them. 
Peter had brought some of those religious Jews with him, amen, as witnesses that he wasn't just fraternizing with the enemy. And I'm telling you, when those Gentiles, they got baptized with the Holy Ghost, Brother May, those six that Paul or Peter brought with them, their eyes got big and their mouths gaped open. They didn't even think a Gentile could get saved and now God's baptizing them with the Holy Ghost. Did you realize that could happen to some folks you think couldn't even get saved? God's able to save them and baptize them with the Holy Ghost. Oh, hallelujah. Let's look what it says. Acts 10, 45. Acts 10, 45. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost for they heard them speak with tongues. How did they know they had the gift of the Holy Ghost? The Bible tells it, for they heard them speak with tongues. Amen. We know they got the baptism. We know those Gentiles were baptized with the Holy Ghost, Brother Dale. They said we knew it when they started speaking in other tongues. Oh, hallelujah. It's right there in the book. And in verse 47, can a man forbid water that these should not be baptized which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? You know what that means? They got it just like we did. How do we get it, Sister Brock? We got it speaking in tongues. We know that they got it because they got it just like we did. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. One more instance. Well, let me give you one more verse before we move on. Acts 11, 15. As Peter got back to the apostles, the other apostles, and the leadership of the church at Jerusalem, he got back there and reported what had happened in Cornelius' household. He said, as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. A pattern has been established. Amen. When you get filled with the Holy Spirit, you're going to speak with other tongues. Hallelujah. One more instance, or two more. Just give me just a moment here. I skipped one. I'm trying to hurry for you for our sakes, and I skipped one. I skipped an individual named Paul. I mean, he was a persecutor of Christianity, but he was struck down on the road. Uh, Damascus saw that bright light, and his life was changed. He got to town. He can't see God sent a brother to pray for him and the Bible said when that brother prayed for him amen that Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit those of other denominations said yes it said he was filled with the Spirit but it never said he spake with tongues and they're right but just a few little days later amen Paul is writing an epistle to the Corinthians and he wrote in there I thank my God I speak in tongues more than you all hallelujah where'd that come from it came from being filled with the Spirit. And last of all, the last instance, amen, Paul visited the Ephesians. When he walked onto the shore, he said to them a question that we all ought to hear. We ought to hear it often. He said, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Have you received the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, since you believed? He was concerned about that. Amen, they said we hadn't even heard about that. Amen, Paul got them all straightened out. Amen. Got him baptized right in water. And then in Acts 19 and 16 it said, and when Paul had laid hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them and they spake with tongues, comma, and they prophesied. That comes as well. But the thing they did, they spoke with tongues. And so to, to answer the question, amen, do you speak in tongues when you get the baptism of the Holy Ghost? I would like to tell you the scriptural pattern is unbroken. The scriptural pattern is, yes, when you get filled with the Spirit, you'll speak with other tongues. We don't have time to preach on that. But that's not something you have to worry about because it's something the Holy Spirit does and not you. You just surrender and the Spirit gives the utterance. It's not words that you form. I said, I wish we had a little time. Glory to God. I said, glory to God. Amen. They've done a recent study and scientifically shown that when people speak in tongues, it does not come from the area of the mind of, of, of thought out speech. It comes from the mind. 
of religious, the part of the mind that's activated under religious expression. You can look it up. The scientific research is there. They don't know what to do with it. But when a person speak in tongue, speaks in tongues, the area of the mind that is responsible for calculated speech is not activated. Why? Because it's not the person doing the speaking. It's the Holy Ghost that gives the utterance. Oh, hallelujah. How many believes it's real? Oh, I'd like to hear him sing one more time. It's real, it's real. I know it's real. This Pentecostal blessing. And I know, I know it's real. Last question. To, amen. Tonight, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Is it for power or purity? Is it for the pleasure of the believer? Or is it for a purpose? You see, so many people see the Holy Spirit as something just to have if one wants to have a great and lively church service. But I want to tell you the purpose of the Holy Ghost isn't so much, though it includes that. It's not so much about what happens inside the church. The purpose of the Holy Spirit is a is about, amen, what the church does when it leaves the building. It's for outside the church walls. Amen. You see, he said, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses. Oh, our world needs Jesus. Thank God for a church service when the Spirit moves and it feels so great. But he's got a greater purpose, and that's to make us a witness to our neighbor, our co-worker, our co student and give you power until you've witnessed under the power of the spirit you don't know what a wonderful experience it is I was in seminary when it break that in the, in the news of so many of the religious figures Pentecostal figures were outed because of their sins or adulteries I had a, a seminary uh, professor who was way up in years I'll never forget the statement he made. I believe it's one of the statements that caused the church, Pentecostal church, to begin to lose the power. And, and, and ironically, it was when they were trying to uphold the power. But here's what he said. We, we were talking about those. The news had just hit. And he said, it just goes to show you that the baptism of the Holy Spirit isn't for purity. It's simply for power to witness. And therefore, you may not have purity in your life, but for a while, you'll still have power to witness because that's what the baptism of the Holy Ghost is for. Now, in a sense, they're right. Jesus said, the baptism of the Holy Spirit comes to give us power to be a witness. But here's what I would like to call your attention to. The thing that gives us the power to witness is the Holy Spirit. And if you get the Spirit, which means wind, power, you can't get the Spirit without getting the Holy with it. The Holy Spirit, His name indicates not only His function, but His nature. And when you receive the Holy Spirit to function in your life with power, He also comes into your life with His nature, and His nature is holy. If you've got real power to be a witness, it's a holy power. If you've got real power for ministry, it's a holy power ministry you may say that a doctor scalpel the purpose of it is to do surgery and you're right but if that scalpel's not sanitized it's going to do more harm than good and the purpose of the baptism is to be a witness but God knows the best way we can be a witness is to live in purity in this world how many knows the Holy Spirit comes with power but he comes with purity that's a message in itself we will leave it there amen would you come musicians and so I want to say one more time the Holy Spirit does a lot of things in our life but one of those he wants to do through Christ as the agent he wants us to experience the baptism of the Holy Ghost brother Keith it didn't used to be so far back but I want to take you back 43 years ago and I want to conclude this service by telling you when I got baptized with the Holy Ghost. Brother Leitner there at First Assembly in Shawnee, Oklahoma. For years there was a rock planter that went across the whole front of the platform and ended at the 
edge over here. I mean, you had to walk way around. Later, they opened it up by the pulpit. But back then, that went across. Three rows of pew. Altar here, altar there, altar over here. Piano was right here. My dad, from the earliest memories I have, he took we two boys. And the piano was further up. I mean, there was no... I mean, the piano was further up on the platform. Here, that planter end, that limestone, I think it was a limestone planter ended. And he'd take us. He'd bring us two boys over here on the steps. There was an altar bench right there, but my dad's a, a shy man. No self-demonstrative uh, attitude in him at all. And he would bring us around here. I can't tell you how many times I saw my shy dad down there on that step, bowed down. He'd begin to pray. I mean, begin to pray. Oh, I can see it right now. It wouldn't be long until he'd lift up his hands. He's back there because he's a little shy to be out there with the rest. But he lifted up his hands. The rest didn't see it, but I can't tell you how many times I saw it. He got his hands in the air and the Spirit began to move up in, upon him. And he began to weep. And all of a sudden, he began to speak loudly in tongues. Totally outside his native temperament. Worshiping God. I had that example from the earliest remembrance. I'll never forget the night at seven years old. I walked down with my dad. He began to pray. He put his hands in the air, began to weep, began to speak in tongues. I was on this side of him. My brother was on the other. Had to separate us. You know how boys are. I was right there at the butt end of that old rock planter. I watched my dad for a while. I peeked around the planter and the teenagers. Three or four of them were laid out on the ground out in the spirit never moved a muscle for three hours and when they came to they were speaking in other tongues I knelt there looked at my dad looked around the printer and I remember I didn't understand it I couldn't tell you the doctrine of it I did tonight all I knew was that it was real and I, at seven years old I lifted my hands in the air and I began to pray I remember Sister Buford, the pastor's wife, coming up behind me, and she laid her hand on me, and she just began to say, praise Jesus, praise Jesus, thank Jesus. And then she began to say, glory, 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 glory. That sounded good to me. So I just began to say, glory, glory, glory. And the next thing I knew, I was speaking in other tongues. You say, it's just a child made up thing. Well, how come it's still good 43 years later? How come what I feel tonight preaching about is the same thing I felt 43 years ago? I'm telling you, it's real. Never doubt what happens at Camp Dove or Youth Camp. It's real. I know there's emotion. I know there's folks that get out of hand and out of order. But that doesn't change. The thing. There's a real empowerment of the Holy Ghost. And think of the amazing thing of it all, that he would put that treasure in these earthen vessels. Hallelujah. Jesus is the baptizer. Seek Him. We were never taught to seek tongues. We were taught to praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. I'm telling you, if you'll lift up the baptizer, He'll baptize you. We'll just stand and worship Him tonight. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, come on, let's praise Him. It's real. It's real. I know that it's real. Do you want the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Come right now. Stand and lift your hands. Do you want the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Come right now. Lift your hands. I want to tell you, the promise is unto you. It's the promise of the Father. He don't go back on His Word. He doesn't break His promise. You need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Would you come and lift your heart and hands? Say, God, I need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Are you here? Would you come right now? Now's the time. Don't hesitate. Believe Him. How many like to be refilled with the Holy Spirit? Hallelujah. Why don't you come and join these? Begin to pray with them. You like to be refilled. It's not by might. It's not by power. It's by my Spirit, saith the Lord. Oh, we're going to need him in these last days. I want you to seek him, not just tonight. I want you to begin to seek him until it happens for you. Oh, hallelujah. Come on. Let's gather in everyone that would and say, God baptize us with the Holy Ghost. Baptize us fresh. Baptize us anew. Baptize us. Oh, we've got to have your power. The things that we're facing. 
the trials, the difficulties, the lost folks around us. We've got to have the power of your Holy Spirit.